by shooting us first way as to roots. It's extremely serious about the doctors. In fact, he, uh, from the land of seven sisters, it was he who kind of included Sikkim into it and called it Ashtalakshmi. There are three major blunders of the Congress party which took the region behind by many decades. See, the crux of this alienation was the Congress mindset of otherization. The I Yatra is not about, you know, just uh, taking out your your Yatra to nowhere and saying that I will do, do Nyaya. Nyaya has actually been done by Bodhichi by developing leadership. If you look at the Congress manifesto, there is something they mentioned about Manipur. What have they mentioned about Manipur? That they will strive for um, administrative settlement. What is administrative settlement? This government under Home uh, Minister Amit Shah has sat, has deliberated with different chief ministers. Home Minister Amit Shah he had camped in Manipur for four days on a stretch, which no other Home Minister now. We will ensure that Manipur becomes the hub of development, just like Assam and uh, Arunachal in the time to come. I mean, uh, who would not? support ethnic polygamy. So I think only Badrupina and, uh, and Brown Gandhi has constant references to, you know, conserving and protecting personal laws. I think the, the insinuation was very clear. It was supporting polygamy, which Imanta was the social is trying to end. Well, and welcome for journalist who has grown up in Shillong. There was always this grievance that we've had with governments, successive governments, about the fact that uh, there's been very little thought that has been given to the northeastern states. And perhaps there was a point in time when you would have gone to what they called the mainland and perhaps have asked the capital of any particular northeastern state, you would have got maximum people getting it completely wrong. Over the last nine years, there's been a renewed focus on the northeast. Why exactly is that the case? Is it because of the number of seats that come in from the northeastern states? It's way lesser than even uh, what you would have seen in other states. So is the northeast politically relevant? We have a very interesting guest joining us, uh, someone who comes from a different city altogether. And the question that I would like to start with uh, Tuhin Sina is that you're not even from the northeast. You're someone who's been in Mumbai, a face on television most of the days as the first started as, as the Mumbai spokesperson. So let me begin by asking you this. You have a book that has been curated, top Northeastern uh, leaders coming together, putting towards what they say is a transformative uh, period within the Northeast. What made you choose this book? Because many would say the Northeast has never been very viable, a grouse that I've always had. Well, great to be on your past podcast, Shavit. But as a writer, today my writing and my politics are basically cognitive. But as a writer, I have been hungry for newer narratives. So the amount of transformation that the country has witnessed under Prime Minister uh, Modi extends to the northeastern states. In fact, the transition in northeastern states has been from tyranny or distance to comfortable proximity. So from eight new from eight airports in 2014, there are some 17 airports today. Four lakh crores have been spent on capital expenditure, and you can see the effect on the ground. You know, so from from Guwahati, um, there are these smaller private carriers which fly to three different destinations of Arunachal Pradesh and places uh, on the eastern border of Arunachal which I believe would be you know, at least 400 to 450 kilometers away from Peter Nagar. Mm -hmm. uh, places that would take a more 24 to 36 hours to travel to in 2014 are being covered in four to six hours. So I think you know the, the amount the amount of transformation, the amount of transition is phenomenal. Most importantly, the infrastructure creation has led to emotional gaps being bridged. So today, when you have a Kiran Riju as an ex-law minister and now Gena as a central minister for earth sciences, it makes the entire region more aspirational. When you have a Pema Khandu from Tabang, one of the areas worst impacted during the 1962 aggression, make Tabang or transform Tabang into a hub of development. You know, that uh, throws new light and new perspective for the younger generation. 
So I think it's a very uh, involved Myanmar generation growing up in the region. So I think they they need to be mainstreamed as much as possible. I think said that all credit goes to Prime Minister Modi because um, you know Modi Ji follows the in management. There's a term called VHAG, hag approach, big hairy audacious goal. So it sets big targets, be it for the economy, be it for a region. And he delivers it in the in the you know uh, in the time which seems very challenging when he mentions it first, but then the execution is where the you know the the success lies. And hats off to the chief ministers, whether it is Hemant or Vishal Park, whether it is Bema uh, Khandu. So I think it was a story waiting to be told. But again, I was aware of my limitations. Along with my co-curator, co-editor, Aditya Pitti, where we had these first uh, initial brainstorming sessions, the entire thing was how do we approach the story because we have limited knowledge. And that was where we came up with, the, with this idea that let us be involved only in a um, supervisory role. Let us get a people who have actually Act been at the forefront of initiating the stage or witness it closely to be the writer. So we started work on it in, in February 2023, or rather March 2023, and we knew that you know it would make sense to bring it out before the elections because you know as for as a politician, I know the, the importance of an election year and the timing of it. So hats off to um, I, I I would say each of the contributors because uh, especially Himanta Biswasharma, Prima Kandu, and Kiran Jitu, they were extremely welcoming to the idea. They were very forthcoming, they were very cooperative and without, you know, their contribution, the book was not as real what it is. That's what it is. What it is. So if I have to ask you, I'm sure in the process of uh, this, putting together this book, you've had the opportunity of being in the Northeast. And of course, we have seen the transformation that has taken place. Before I take this, I would also like to tell you this, Tawin, because as someone who started during the peak of insurgency in Meghalaya, there was always this grouse that we had that look here, the number of seats that we have from states like Meghalaya or for the others is barely anything. And why should Delhi really look at us? Uh, so that was always that anger that we had towards like, be it in Kashmir, you would have had the international media talking about it. Northeast, for the very longest time, not a single national news network even had their own uh, reporters, barring someone in just in Kohati saying that, a report in Guwahati is good enough, representative of the entire North. How have things really changed? When you yourself have gone there, what is the change that you sense? See, the crux of this alienation was the Congress mindset of otherization. They always believed that certain parts of the country did not intrinsically or inherently belong to the country. So they would pamper those regions without really, you know, intending to solve existing problems. So with the Northeast, for many years, they purposely, for, may, for many decades rather, they purposely did not build infrastructure because of this, per, you know, flawed perception that they had or flawed, flawed, flawed notion that they had that if they built infrastructure in the border areas, that would upset China. At least this is what the UPA defense minister would say till as late as early 2014. Yeah. But this, this, this attitude of uh, this meek and this uh, very escapist attitude only aggravated the problems of them. You know, we must realize that uh, that Manipur is the land of Chitragata, the body of princess who married, uh, who Arjun married. Uh, Arunachal is the land of Rukmini, who Krishna had married. In fact, uh, um, Till today, there is a custom that every year in March and April, people from Arunachal travel all the way to Gujarat as Bharatis, uh, people from the clan of uh, Rukmini, to participate in the marriage of uh, Rukmini and, and uh, uh, Krishna. But this mentality of treating certain parts of our country as, you know, as other parts which needed special treatment or which, you know, um, ideally should not have been made mainstream. I think this is what has cost the country a lot. There are three major blunders of the Congress party which took the region behind by many decades. One was the 1962 broadcast of Nehru during the war 
where uh, Bone Bila, which was a part of the then NEFA, Northeastern Frontier Agency, which Arunachal was then known as and yeah. remained a part of Assam. When Bone Bila was taken over by the Chinese forces, he very, um, you know, submissively said, my heart goes out to the people of Northeast. That was a very abrupt message, but the scars of it remained for many decades. There was a mistrust between the central government and the people of Northeast. If you talk in detail with uh, with uh, somebody like Kiran Rijuti, he would tell you the first-hand experiences of his father and grandfather because they have been uh, they have been socially active. They have been, if, in fact, his father was politically active. He would tell you um, first-hand experiences that would leave you completely numb. Then, in 1965, Indira Gandhi got the IAF to bond. Mizoram, which again was then a part of um, uh, Lushi Hills or part of Assam. In the process, several civilians were killed. This only aggravated to mistrust. And then in February 1983, there was this Nelay massacre, massacre in Assam, uh, Assam which 1,700 people dead, most of whom were refugees, whose cause Rahul Gandhi champions today through his Nayatra in the Northeast. So I think you know these three blunders of the Congress party had left scars which were very difficult to heal. Now what has happened during Modi ji I think, apart from the infrastructure creation, apart from the cultural renaissance, the mainstreaming, the cultural mainstreaming, I think one very important aspect which not many people talk, talk about is the way he has developed leadership in the Northeastern states. Somebody called Bangalore Cognac, a lady mm -hmm. under the name of Magnon Konya, who is now the Rajya Sabha member from Nagaland and the only woman parliamentarian from Nagaland in Nagaland's history. You know, such representation makes a huge difference to the people of the state, to the people of the region. And she, in fact, comes from a region within Nagaland which was worst impacted by insurgency. So that is the level of thought that goes into nurturing future leadership. Like I mentioned, when Kiran Rijuji was made the law minister, that was in fact doing nyay to a region which was left behind by the by the apathy of the of several Congress governments up to independence. Nyay Yatra is not about you know just uh, taking out your your yatra to nowhere and saying that I will do do nyay. Nyay has actually been done by Bodhichi by developing leadership uh, again, uh, the ex uh, state president of Nagaland, uh, forgetting his name now. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, I think you know, for the first time, you have people, leaders from the Northeast, talking about national issues. That is a huge difference. But if I may ask you with regards to the fact that this alienation aspect, do you still believe that it is completely gone? Because I'll tell you, there was a period when we were growing up uh, in the Northeast, there was always this that we are different from India. And there was the separatist mindset that was brewing because of the insurgency that we are not part of India. Of course, things have changed. There's no doubt about that. But do you still believe that what is happening in, partic in particular in Manipur gives rise to this alienation concept, the, the very fact that many would say that you've not handled Manipur that way. Well. Manip Manipur, I would say, is probably the only region where uh, some of these grave problems remain unresolved. Again, when you talk about Manipur, you need to also accept the fact that between the, uh, March 2017 and April 2023, the six years and one month was also probably the longest phase of peace and prosperity, uninterrupted peace and prosperity. But yes, there were some, some you know, dark shadows from the past which we believed had been exercised, which we believed had done, had been dispensed uh, completely, but which sprang back. You know, there are two things which, which uh, unfortunately or fortunately, we've not been able to speak any detail because of, uh, because they, have their ramifications. What is this construction of uh, uh, India's highway right up to Thailand, which would pass through Myanmar? 
that was always meant to that was always supposed to have geopolitical ramifications right and the other is the way Venetian government had come down heavily on illegal poppy trade the both of these have had an impact on the ground so a lot of the violence that you have seen have been triggered by by forces inimical to india um Manipur is a difficult land. In fact, you know the. But how, how 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 would you respond to the fact that when they say that, unfortunately, this instinct of polarization that the that the BJP essentially has, or the binary that they would like to operate, does not really work in the northeastern states. That is one of the reasons why you quickly learned that, that the CA and RC becomes issues that you would not be able to put together in the northeastern states. Party which uses binaries is the Congress party. Right. If you look at the Congress manifesto, there is something they preach it about Manipur. More after they preach about Manipur, that they will strive for um, administrative settlement. What is administrative settlement? Is that giving in to the demands of a separate state within Manipur? So there is a lot of mischief in the Congress mindset. On the contrary, when we We have always believed in one India. We have always believed in complete unison between you know the different states and the center. CA is a completely different aspect. You know, it does not concern Manipur mm-hmm. because uh, it concerns refugees from the three countries which don't impact Manipur. But you know, on a larger note, if you travel across north northeast, the sheer magnitude. in the number of tribes and the conflicts between the tribes were far more enormous than years ago in fact you know very diligently this government under under home minister amit shah has sat has deliberated with different chief ministers and in fact 80 to 85% of the disputes which have existed from eternity and that includes uh, the border disputes between between assam and arunachal pradesh that Includes some of the border disputes between other states. I think conclusively resolved. Yes, Manipur is an exception, but again, things are far better, you know, now than what they were a few months ago. But had it been a Congress government, I can tell you that either the eighty to eighty-five percent of the disputes that have been resolved would have continued to exist. You, you're talking about the various accords that have been signed, various Ulfa various being various one of them. Insurgent groups, which have actually uh, quit. Insurgency and join the mainstream. But I mean, just think about the history of the northeastern states and how the Congress has also dealt with it. We've always seen a scenario that the ultimate goal of bringing in the insurgent groups have also been with the fact that if you agree with our constitution, rest of the things can be worked out. Autonomy is one factor. Uh, recognizing these groups is another factor that has been being brought in. These are all parts of various accords that were basically signed. But Lal Denga being one of them, who whom you brought into the main, uh, you know, mainstream. So there has always been that a little bit of a compromise because I, at the end of the day, the identity. is something that matters a lot to the people of the northeast so many would say did did the bjp really find it troublesome to deal with this identity issue you know, on the contrary this identity crisis was aggravated because of deprivation for example if today and in fact even uh, for a program like lal se jal uh, program which we put on the real time dashboard the success rate is not 90% till in the hilly regions of right. nagaland and arunachal pradesh when these basic amenities and facilities were deprived the people were deprived these basic amenities and facilities by default the identity crisis they were reminded of the identity crisis but when these basic uh, you know needs and amenities are being provided for diligently A lot of the so-called manufactured identity crisis has anyway disappeared. You know, like I mentioned, um, in the case of Arunachal and Manipur, and there are many other uh, instances which I can quote from history, where these northeastern states have had a have had an intrinsic link with India, with Bharat. I think it was a false narrative of. Communist part, uh, communist historians, and uh, you know, compromised Congress, the governments which want to aggravate it, or which allow these, um, you know, this identity crisis to be manifested, or you know, 
uh, aggravated in people's mind because it suited them politically. But for us, there are no distinctions. You know, uh, while researching for the book, there were at least, obviously, you know, as a writer, as a creative person, I have a plan to deviate from the subject and uh, meander into creative areas. Hmm. I had discovered at least 10 corroborative links from the era of Mahabharat with the Northeast. What is it? Well, there are multiple instances. Like I mentioned uh, to you about uh, Chitrangada, kind of, um, in fact, uh, the temples in uh, there was a temple in Meghale, which we were told, um, uh, you know, belonged to one of the, like, uh, Kamachi temple, for Kamachi. example, has its own uh, history. There are temples in Meghale, parts from, and I'm sure you were... Which is closer to Tripura, Bangladesh and... Uh, Tripura, Sundari temple, whatever. So, I think, you know, these links were very clear. Uh, once you delve into the history, once you delve into the... The research part of it. Somehow they were they were, they were looked, they were ignored by the Oriswati community. So what, uh, what is it that while curating this entire book, uh, you felt that something that you did not really know about it? Because I see some uh, very interesting, I'll get into each of, each one of them, particularly what Kiran Riju you spoke about the border villages and the transformation of Assam. I've seen it uh, myself. There was a point in time, Tony, let me just tell you, when I was studying in Calcutta, and I had to go back home. At the top of the hat, I would like to go back to Shillong because of, of course, the weather, etc. We, we never wanted to stay back in Guwahati because for various reasons. One, uh, you know, it was difficult to stay in, in Guwahati at that point in time. And for people like us from Shillong, we would say, like, rush to uh, Shillong as soon as possible. Things have changed. And I'll come to that aspect also. But I want to ask you, as, especially for someone who's got that ringside view of the Northeast, what is it that you felt was not really known and perhaps it was had it been told earlier to the people of the country things would have been far different the way we saw northeast would have been very different the prism would have been very different but if you if you ask me about that one thing i think it's the wonderful hindi which he gives on the northeast i think that was an eye opener for me. In, a, a, anything in particular that you would like you to know, share I'm most of them speak wonderful, flawless Hindi. Obviously, the accent is different. They understand Hindi completely. They watch all the latest Hindi movies. The same applies to um, sections within the, within Nagaland. So I think that was an eye opener because, like I said, you know, uh, Congress governments have made us believe that it's another country that there is a uh, there is a specific reason why we don't want uh, them to be treated at par with India. But I think, you know, the, the, the meeting of minds, the meeting of hearts is completely a conventional capital. But you have brought in ex-congressmen to write about the Northeast. So you are saying that the yeah, Congress has not really the, done enough for the Northeast. Yeah, but you are, right now they are in the BJP, they were all congressmen. Down, it comes down to what I mentioned to you. The basic problems the Northeast of the way they have to make the right the basic amenities of any decade. So obviously those politicians, BJP, uh, BJP, came into existence in 1980. The that was Jansang yeah. and Dalton did not have uh, much of a footprint in the Northeast. Obviously, RSS Karikarpa, they deserve the credit because they have been in the Northeast for many decades. Which now. many wouldn't have any idea about because yeah. I, like in even a state like Meghalaya, which is Christian yeah. dominated, the RSS had many would say very, uh, some so the, would say even the, like the it's, a, it's almost like a sleeper cell. But even now, 20 years ago, even in the time of Vajpayee, there was no um, clear mandate or no, you know, no, no serious effort to expand the BJP in the Northeast. Mm. So obviously, the government of that era, you know, most of the state governments would belong to the Congress Party. So by default, since BJP did not have a presence or a or a notable presence in the area, the politicians of you know in that era belong to the Congress Party. Today, if they have switched to going to the BJP, it is purely because they trust the BJP. They believe that BJP can deliver on the ground, which BJP has delivered in the last 10 years. But no. So I don't think you can grudge, you know, the chapters being written by an ex-congressman because uh, Congress, any which way, is is uh, is, a, is hibernating. So probably every Congress person today is either going to be in BJP or at PFC or uh, in Shinde Sena or wherever. 
Well, let me get into a little specifics of the book because uh, what I found very interesting was in particular Kiran Rajeju's uh, chapter where he speaks about the development in border villages. And of course, you, have, you face a lot of criticism from the Congress party saying that, look here, the Chinese have been extremely aggressive, particularly about the Arunachal Pradesh. And the response that has come in from the government is not adequate enough. Kiran Rijiju talks about the fact that if today things have actually changed is because of the kind of uh, development that has taken place in the border villages. Is there anything that you would like to add to that? See, the Rahul Gandhi takes his dictations from the morning times speech. So let us not uh, get into what he says. But fact is, you have to credit Modi government for very innovative out of box statements. Who would think that a quarter village 400 or 450 kilometers away from Pita Rather on the further side or the, or the further, on the eastern side would become a hub of development uh, and uh, you know something which could be replicated in other parts of the state. But there is a rational behind it. You know, when you make uh, the border villages the first centers of development, obviously the due to the quality connectivity, the the intrusion gets reported early. So as a result of which our, our army can take preemptive action or can reach uh, can take remedial action at the earliest, which is what has happened because intrusions have come down remar remarkably in the last uh, few years. Again, you know, uh, if you trust the people in the border area, and trust comes when you when you fulfill the basic needs, when you ensure that they get basic education and they get uh, hospitals. Now. They are also completely aligned with the, with the government. Right. So if they feel that there is something which means they feel something suspicious, they are the ones who become stakeholders and report it to the government. Yeah. I think a, a, a good example of uh, the way uh, we have reached out to the Northeast or we have made sure that Northeast doesn't suffer in any way was during the COVID crisis where drone technology was employed to ensure that vaccines were mm -hmm. delivered to you know, villages which barely had 10 or 50 people living over there. So I think that was remarkable and uh, like I mentioned, there are several firsts also, the national anthem being played national for the first time in Tripura Assembly, then the Nagaland Assembly which was not thought much of. Two of these assemblies. Yeah. So, which was unthinkable at some point in time because I remember for the longest time, I, well, in my growing up years, I've never celebrated the Independence Day because there was a bun that was called by most of the insurgency, insurgent now, groups. Also, you used to have a parallel blue flag, which uh, now, you know, obviously they only have the India flag. I saw the India flag for the first time on 15th of August was perhaps when I was in my 12th standard. That would be um, the way it's the, if you follow the Indian idol and you know other singing competitions, the way singers and their musicians are emerging from the northeast. And their music is not confined to music of the region, they are very fluent in Hindi. Yeah. I think that's the turning point. That's the um that's the way the northeast has become as prediction. But do you believe that there are still challenges that you have to face because like it or you don't, because uh, BJP was always seen as the outsider party, the party which was more seen as the Hindutva ideology party, not really being able to, uh, you know, accept others. In particular, like for example, in the state that I come from, uh, which is a Christian dominated state, for them, the BJP is seen as, okay, it's a Hindu party. I'm not going to align with them. You know, the Emily represents your... Uh, the very constituency that I come from. Yes, Alexander Heck was been a part of BJP from 1998. So, in fact, meeting him was an eye opener on for us. Hmm. Aditya, my co author, my co editor, and I traveled to Wekhale. I had been in touch with him because I was introduced to Alexander through a common friend. And he was one of the most warm, he's one of the most warm, hospitable guys. And uh, when I got to know that he has been a part of BJP from 1998, you know, inspired by the ideals of Vajpayee and Vanaji, it was a huge eye opener for me. See, BJP represents two distinct things. One is development, Vikas, and the other is um, national security. And Hindu is a very essential part of uh, national security because uh, of, of serving national interests. Well, 
but uh, it has never been dis discriminated against minorities. So those who firmly believe in Vikas are anyway going to be with the BJP. And that applies to the entire region. Today, BJP is the natural ruling party for the entire region. Barring Meghale, where uh, we are in alliance, today we have, uh, and, and Meghale, where we are more of an equal part of it, NDBV. Today we have a government in every state of uh, of the northeast, uh, except Sikkim also. Hopefully Sikkim uh, will see a change post 2024. So I would say BJP is the national ruling party of the northeast, and uh, Hindutva is more about uh, national interests in the northeast. The northeast, anyway, you know. Uh, they have bore the brunt of illegal migration from Bangladesh. Mm. Tripura has been impacted by it. Uh, Assam has been impacted by it. Meghalaya has been impacted by it. So they know the significance of what we talk. They know the significance of of uh, the demography distortion. In fact, one of the chapters written by Dr. Ankita Dapta specifically talks about the way the democracy of Kobe is something compromised because of the work that politics of Kobe and how our, 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 our the indigenous right. population also to a great extent has borne the brunt of it. Absolutely. The Delhi massacre being one of the, you know, the great casualties of uh, uh, unmitigated and unbridled uh, illegal migration of the Northeast has witnessed for several decades. But, you know, uh, in Himanta Vishwasharma, finally, they see a chief minister who is serious about addressing the problem. So imagine, who would have imagined 10 or 15 years ago that a state with 35% Muslim population, and these are official figures, these are not important figures, would have a chief minister who is so upbeat about initiating reforms in the Muslim community, who is so upbeat about protecting the rights of the Hindus. So that is the change which Northeast was witnessing. That there is always this constant refrain coming in from the AIUDF that this is an anti-minority chief minister. Himanta is an anti-minority oh. chief minister for his because he wakes up every day with a statement against the Muslim community. That's the perception that was built by the opposition. So he's been talking about uh, ending polygamy. Hmm. So those who are you know big fans of polygamy, Rahul Gandhi and AIUDF or Vajrudi uh, would have a problem with it. But I think I don't think he's anti-minority at all. He has a huge following, at least uh, you know. And that's the interesting part. Women within the minority communities have warmed up to the BJP. They realize that BJP is talking about uh, positive changes which will improve their lives. Mm. I mean, uh, who would not support ending polygamy? So I think only Badrupina and uh, and Rahul Gandhi with his constant references to you know conserving and protecting personal laws. I think the, the insinuation was very clear. It was supporting what it can, which Himanta was is trying to end. You've, been, you've interacted in the course of this book, you've interacted with several other leaders also. One of the other criticisms that most of these leaders faced was during the time when there was this crisis in Manipur. Manipur was burning. The allegation against Kiran Rajiju was that as a union minister, he wasn't speaking about Manipur. Uh, Chief Minister of Assam also faced a similar sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, disagreement, many would say, that many had with the views but that he's had. Minister Amit Shah had in Manipur for four days, your stretch, which no other Home Minister down. Himanta Biswasharma ji had gone to Manipur in Asia. But you know, when the situation was clearing up, it was important that the control entirely be under the Home Minister. The situation was being monitored very closely. In fact, uh, the situation had improved after the initial violence in May. But if you remember, on for certain the videos which uh, you know which of an of an occurrence which took place two and a half months ago were propped up right for the parliament session, which was done obviously with magnified intent, and you know unfortunately that led to a fresh spell of violence. But like I said, you know, uh, in fact, we were in a dilemma. How do we cover Manipur? Would it be sensitive to, you know, uh, talk about Manipur in a situation like this? Finally, decided that, in fact, the entire 
objective of this violence was to take away from the positive work which has happened in Manipur in the last six or seven years. And by not speaking about the positive work, we would be doing a disservice to the state. Mm -hmm. So the Manipur chapter is written, we consciously decided to have it written by a person. You who, speak about entrepreneurship in that. Yeah, so who's not involved with politics at all, who has nothing to do with politics. He leads a firm which provides training to people. Uh, skill, skill developing essentially. So he remained put uh, in Manipur throughout the turbulence and he's written a beautiful chapter talking about the aspirations of the youth of uh, the state. Right. And when you, when you uh, get into the history of it, do read a chapter by anthropologist and theologian Rami Desai. She's talking about the history of conflicts in the entire Northeast over the past many centuries or at least the past couple of centuries, and how in the last 10 years most of these stand resolved. See, whatever happened in Manipur is extremely unfortunate. But the fact is that, you know, when uh, you have a past which is laden with unending conflict somewhere, it becomes difficult to assume that the scars have been completely, or the dark shadows of the past have been completely done away with. At times, they do spring back. But we will ensure that Manipur becomes a hub of development, just like Assam and uh, Arunachal in the time to come. You know, what I also found very interesting when I was going through this book and I was actually trying to find out what is your link with the Northeast. So, that was part of my research. I want to ask you this, uh, to in, in the course of it, what is it that stuck the most to you? And was there a point in time when someone told you that, look here, why would you get into something that is not going to be extremely profitable, viable, or may not make the headlines that many would like with their book coming up? Because Northeast does not make that kind of headlines. Personally, I find it disturbing when a land as beautiful as Peshir or a land as beautiful as the Northeastern states have played with the conflict or played with violence. So in 2018, I wrote a book on Kashmir. Hmm. Uh, it was it was packaged as a novel, a beautiful romantic story. But essentially, the romantic story was between Kashmir and India. So the so the boy represented India, who came from you know the Hindi heartland. The girl he was in love with belonged to Kashmir, and it's essentially it was a story which spanned across thirty years. But whenever they would meet, there would be some disturbance. So there was a larger simile of Kashmir and Bharat being together, but somewhere they were done apart or they were pulled apart by constant uh, confusion. So for me as a writer, a creative person, the Northeast was a very fascinating, it still continues to be a very fascinating space. There is a lot of enigma attached to it because of the lack of awareness. At the same time, the visuals which come out of uh, um, the Northeastern states, they're very compelling. They draw you in. The, you want to visit Chiran uh, There's a new, new name for Chiran now, the, mm -hmm. the place which has the highest rate. Mosinra. Yeah. You want to visit uh, Tawang, the place which was for the butt brand of uh, Chinese destruction in 1962. You want to visit the Barak Valley in Assam because every time you hear about it, there are visuals which automatically form in your mind. There are visuals attached to it which are very uh, endearing and very compelling, like I said. So the book is my first serious attempt to understand the people of Northeast. And for me as a politician, now the challenge is to take it offline. Right. You know, so with one of my previous books, Versa Munida, after writing the book, I actually went to the village of his birth. In fact, I, I had spent last Independence Day with his descendants, 300 of them. They distributed Hindi copies of the book and had a chat with them on Versa Munida's lineage and uh, his contribution to the weeks. At some point of time, I believe I would like to imagine a Tawang. Um, the one that goes, where you talk about national security, about play happening there. So I think that's how time comes to full circle. If as a politician I can make it happen, if I can make this book go beyond the 
being a book, it to an offline movement, it to offline properties, I think I could, it would serve uh, me and the larger cause, the whole world of quotes. One final question, because, you know, the BJP essentially has projected this nine years of uh, Act East policy as something that is the only reason why there's been a large scale transformation. But what many forget is that this was also done when Vajpayee was the Prime Minister. The very fact that, you know, Afspa was removed from Tripura along with the Chief Minister that pointed to Manik Sarkar and LK Advani ensuring that, you know, Afspa was being removed from Tripura from most of the police stations. So many would say that this is, this is a long drawn process. So why only cre credit Prime Minister Modi for the uh, entire transformation no, 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 taken no, place no, in no, Northeast? No, no, no. was the first Prime Minister who was extremely serious about the Northeast. In fact, he, uh, from the land of seven sisters, it was he who kind of included Sikkim into it and called it Ashtalakshmi. And for the first time, infrastructure creation, especially highway uh, construction on, on an unprecedented scale was undertaken in the office. But then post Vashpiji, we had a Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who was a righteous Sabha member from oh, Assam, but who never spoke about properties. I don't know how many times he visited an office, probably a couple of times in the year. But I think the positive initiative that Vajpayee Ji had undertaken in his tenure between 1998 to 2004, a lot of it was squandered away, a lot of it was undone by a very uh, detached central government between 2004 to 2014. And that is where the role of Prime Minister Modi becomes very important. You know, when as when we uh, pursue the larger mix of our goals, when we uh, surge ahead towards a $5 trillion economy in the next two to three years, and potentially a $20 trillion economy by 2047, you need to understand that from here, the bulk of development of, you know, the, the key impetus to GDP has to come from hither to unexplored areas, unexplored regions. And that is where the Northeast, along with many other tier three cities across the country becomes very important. The role of sustainable development, in fact, uh, you know, what sus planned sustainable development can deliver in the Northeast can set up an example for the entire world. The GDP, Contribution of Northeastern states used to be sub 2.6% in 2014. That has gone up uh, to some extent to 3% as of today. But I'm sure with all the initiatives which we have undertaken in the last few years, in the time to come, it will see an exponential increase, probably 4.5% in the next um, 10 years or so. So that's what makes uh, the Northeast very significant, very important. And more, most importantly, you know, the developmental model which Modi has put into practice in Northeast can serve as a benchmark for the entire world. For any underdeveloped region, obviously, infrastructure provides a huge impetus. With infrastructure comes um, the setting up of cultural property. For example, when you talk about Nagale, the Hornbill Festival, which 20 years ago used to be attended by maybe a handful of people from the Northeast and South from Delhi. If you just go to the Delhi, if you happen to be at the Delhi airport and the first people in December, you will see, you know, chunks of people, a large set of people at any point of time wanting to take the flight to the Northeast to attend the Hornbill Festival. I think that's how a region can be transformed, Modi has set a paradigm, he has given a template to the world and I think uh, this model can be replicated anywhere, be it Africa or be it uh, you know, in parts of South America. Well, I would say that, you know, there are several things which are not discovered for a very long time. I did not realize there was a cherry blossom festival that now takes place in Shillong and that was next to my house for the longest time. So, I, mean, I think so there are better times I to come for that. So, now, see, uh, there is never any dearth of newer initiatives. I Absolutely. Another part of Meghale, which is the Daru Hills, yeah. which is the, the place called Taro. Tura. Tura. I'm not mistaken. I'm assuming that the airport is 
coming being contemplated over there. So imagine the level of development that comes. Uh, surprisingly, you say the maximum number of chief ministers of Meghalaya have come from that yeah. part. So imagine when half of the state in terms of land mass, which has remained ignored until now, imagine if that, you know, takes center stage from here and propels the state forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tuvil. First of all, I would say that thank you for taking the initiative of, of writing about the Northeast because this wasn't really spoken much about for a very long time. So thank you very much. Interesting conversation. And I'm hoping that after this, there would be a lot more people who wanted to know. I'm not trying because, you know, he's in Pune right now, but, uh, you know, he's been a equal partner in this entire journey. So th thank you very much. Yep. Thank you to both of you for taking this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you.